Michael, Mar Michael Marletta holds the C.H. and Annie Lee Chair in the Molecular Biology of Diseases at the University of California, Berkeley. He's also a professor of chemistry in the Department of Chemistry and professor of biochemistry in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology at Berkeley. Before that, he had served as professor of biological chemistry at the University of Michigan and is chairman of the Department of Chemistry at Berkeley. He earned his PhD in pharmaceutical chemistry from the University of California, San Francisco in 1978. Working at the interface of chemistry and biology, Michael, Mar Michael Marletta has made groundbreaking contributions to our understanding of essential cellular control system, an essential cellular control system, nitric, nitric oxide signaling. Nitric oxide functions as a regulator in numerous biological processes, including blood vessel homeostasis, immune defense, and a broad range of neural functions. He's discovered the key nitric acid producing enzyme, nitric, ox nitric oxide synthase, and the critical cellular target of nitrogen oxide, soluble granulate cyclase. A guiding principle of his research has been his astute use of evolutionary relationships and of structural analysis to discover and eliminate molecular mechanisms. Among about a dozen prestigious awards that have come to him are a MacArthur Fellowship and the UCSF 150th Anniversary Alumnus Award. He's on a number of editorial boards, or has served on a number of editorial boards, including Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, he's a member of the foundation board of his alma mater at Fredonia State University of New York. He's been elected to the National Academy of Medicine, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Sciences, and then the pinnacle in 2016, he was elected a member of the American Philosophical Society. His title this morning is Serendipity and Discovery from Nitric Oxide to Viagra. Thank you very much indeed. You saved the best for last. Um, it's a real pleasure to, to be here. Um, listening to you describe nitric oxide synthase and soluble guanylate cyclase as targets. I was thinking of a good percentage of the audience thinking, oh my God, what's coming? <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think uh, I will be staying out of the weeds. Uh, I expect to, but uh, hopefully telling you a story of how nitric oxide went from something that I would say in the mid-80s, those of us that were saying nitric oxide was serving an important biological role, uh, some were saying that the science police should come and have us arrested because it co clearly couldn't be serving that role. So I'm going to tell you a story of the pieces of the discovery, how they came from different places and even different eras. Uh, and hopefully in the end, have, give you some sense of, of uh, something you know already, which is that we scientists indeed have begun to focus, we can focus pretty narrowly than, than Humboldt, but um, when we do, we occasionally find something interesting. So that's really what the story is about today. If, if I had started, uh, and, and I've said uh, to an audience before, if I was to come here and tell you that I was going to tell you, I was going to talk about the biological properties of nitric oxide, you might envision something like this painting here. This is Charles Sheeler's painting. It's called an American Landscape. It's actually the River Rouge Ford manufacturing uh, plant back in the day. And the reason that I would say that is because of the effluent from the smokestack. Uh, higher oxides of nitrogen are toxic, and at least that would have been um, your thinking. And the reason that you would have thought that is because you may not in the back or up, up at the top be able to read the small letters of all the terrible things that happen to you if you um, inhale nitric oxide because it's a gas, but you can certainly see the skull and crossbones. The molecular formula is beautifully simple. It's just one atom of nitrogen and one atom of oxygen. I should just pause for a minute and 
often people say, yes, but that's what the dentist gives me when, I, when I'm supposed to be. And that actually is a very important difference. That's two nitrogens and one oxygen. That's not very toxic, and it does, in fact, put you in a state where you don't remember what the dentist was doing. Um, on the other hand, uh, so as I said, uh, in, the, in the middle 80s, things really took off. If you simply look at the number of papers published per year that involve nitric oxide in the title or the abstract of the paper. Usually in science, when something like this happens, you can usually point to biology and say biology must have gotten involved in the, in the, in the, in the fact, in it, and that's in fact what, what happened. Now, let me, let me at least come to something uh, that occurs daily now in every major medical center in the world, and that is uh, sort of, in some sense, the end of the story, and then I'll come back and take it apart in some pieces. So um, infants, premature infants, are pretty much these days routinely treated with, with uh, nitric oxide because they suffer from pulmonary hypertension when they're born. So their nitric, nitric oxide, as I said, is a gas, so it's in the cylinder here. And um, that cylinder is now behind this gizmo here. And this gizmo is going to control how much NO is delivered to this infant. And these are in the days when, uh, when I and some of my friends here were all at the University of Michigan. And this nurse, Mary Bruchelle, says it much better than I could say it with the impact that this has had. But I did see it with my very eyes to see a blue infant uh, breathe nitric oxide and turn pink in a matter of, of minutes, pink from the of course, the hemoglobin that's now well oxygenated because the pulmonary hypertension has been treated. I, I, I take an aside here for a minute to say that, that I think many, most of you know that you can't just go off and do experiments on humans willy-nilly. There are human use, human use, I think that'll even be true after January 21st. <laughs> the, there, okay, I got it out of my system. <laughs> I think. Um, Probably not. Uh, anyway, <laughs> anyway. Uh, what, so what I was going to say was that how do you convince a human use committee to treat an infant with a very toxic molecule? The, the first person to do this was an anesthesiologist. His name is Warren Zapol. He's at uh, Mass General. And he went to the human use committee at MGH and he said, look, OSHA has regulated how much NO short order cooks could be exposed to. So he just did the math down to an infant, the size of an infant, and decided that 30 to 40 parts per million for four hours at a stint is enough to not kill the infant, but dilate the vessels in the infant's blood and allow it to turn pink, as I just described. And so, as I said, this is done now routinely uh, in the United States and, and, for that matter, around the world. So uh, those of my, my friends here that know me know that I'm not one for moderation, but here's my moderation piece of the talk. Um, this was said by Paracelsus much better than I could over the next 20 minutes. Poison is in everything. Uh, no thing is without a poison. It's the dosage that makes it a poison or a remedy. In, in some sense, this is, the, this is really the story of using a molecule as toxic as nitric oxide to carry out some of the biological functions that I'm going to describe and that I already described in the sense of dilating blood vessels. So it's, a, it's, it's everything in moderation. Okay, I, I thought it might be important to do two things here at the very beginning, because uh, I don't think many of you looked at the periodic table this morning, probably before you came here. And, and I just want to, well, first of all, I, I, you know, I still, I look, look at it, every time I look at it and think, wow, everything is made of just these elements. But the only ones we're going to talk about today are carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And I simply put them up there on the periodic table to remind you that they're right next to each other. Atomic-wise, they're actually quite similar to one another. Now, O2, we know very well. Two molecules of oxygen hooked together, you're breathing it now. You're, it's going to keep you moving around. It is what drives cellular metabolism. And the reason that the science police would have had us arrested back in the 80s when we were saying that NO had such important properties is because one of the reasons it is so toxic and CO, carbon monoxide, for the same reason, they're really very similar to oxygen. 
many of the kinds of processes that, that NO can get involved with interferes with what oxygen normally does. So they're very similar chemically, um, but they have, as it turns out, very different functions. And biology, if nothing else, is if, I always treat biology as kind of a take-home exam. Uh, if you give it enough time, it'll come up with a solution. And chances are, if, if it is a take-home exam and I give it to all of you, I'll probably get a couple hundred different solutions. But I'm going to give you a long time to work on the exam. Um, and, and that's how biology ends up solving the problem. So even though I will not discuss the molecular aspects for how nature has figured out how to handle nitric oxide and not have it interfere with oxygen, that is a formidable chemical problem that nature solved. Now, I also want to just remind you that our planet today is very different from the planet when it was formed. And the reason for bringing this up is that when the planet was formed, there wasn't any oxygen on the planet. There was a lot of iron in the, in the oceans because there, there, there wasn't any oxygen to react with the iron. And it wasn't until around this period, about two and a half billion years ago, that oxygen appeared in the, in the, on the Earth. And the organisms that did that was a simple blue-green algae called cyanobacteria. I put the symbol here for if you were transporting oxygen. You can easily see that it's both corrosive and flammable. Um, and the first major extinction that occurred on this planet, where 99% of all life was extinguished on this planet, happened two and a half billion years ago when oxygen appeared because of the cyanobacteria. So we talk about the mass extinctions of the dinosaurs and, 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 and maybe some of the mass extinctions to come if we don't get to our senses. Uh, but, but at this time, two and a half billion years ago, 99% uh, of the planet was wiped out. That that survived figured out how to use oxygen. That's the point of bringing it up now. And the bang for the buck of using oxygen to, to generate energy for life is huge, and that's why we run that knife edge of using it. But uh, th the main reason for putting this up is to say that I was never really surprised that biology was using nitric oxide as a molecule to do the things that it does. Frankly, I was much more worried about the fact that we walk around in 20% oxygen, 21% oxygen, every day, and that itself is a pretty toxic uh, environment. So going back to the theme, nature has figured out how to balance these two and to use them. So let's tell this little bit of story now of how this nitric oxide business came to be. The first major piece of it is with the molecule nitroglycerin. So nitroglycerin, as you probably know, well, you may not know, was discovered in 1847 by an Italian chemist, Sombrero. It was commercialized by Alfred Nobel. Most people know that that's how he made his money. He made his money figuring out a way to mix uh, nitroglycerin in a way that didn't explode. Uh, but it did quite frequently in the factories. In fact, his brother was killed with, with others in a factory explosion in 1864. It was a physician in Britain, though, who figured out that you could treat patients that suffer from angina pectoris, which is a chest pain because of constricted blood vessels in your heart, and your heart doesn't get enough oxygen, and the muscles don't get enough oxygen, and so that induces the pain that people feel from angina. Ironically, Nobel was prescribed nitroglycerin in 1896. I'll come back to that in just a minute. But this, this idea that nitroglycerin worked to dilate blood vessels, to relieve chest pain, lingered from its first use until 1979 when Fred Murad, making a guess that NO might actually, or that nitroglycerin might actually decompose to nitric oxide, he just made a guess that that might happen because there were a variety of drugs that were now being used, amyl nitrite and a variety of other related drugs that all had the same sort of property. They all had some sort of nitrate piece to them. And so he, in 1979, treated a blood vessel with nitric oxide and the blood vessel relaxed. He 
I think he would say, if he was standing here next to me, that he never expected that to be physiological, that NO would actually be the physiological agent that we were making to dilate blood vessels. But that turned out to be the case. So let's go to Nobel just for a minute. Um, in a letter that he wrote in 1896, uh, there's the Swedish up here. If you read Swedish, I don't. So here's my heart trouble will keep me in Paris for another few days. That's a pity. Uh, until my doctors are in complete agreement about my immediate treatment. Isn't it the irony of fate that I've been prescribed, his abbreviation for nitroglycerin, to be taken internally? They call it trinitrin, so as not to scare the chemist and the public. <laughs> and I'm sure there may, you know people, or somebody here may, may use nitroglycerin to relieve chest pain, still used today. So, we're, we're not actually, this is not drawn to scale. We started out in the, in the, in the 19th century, but we're going to quickly get to the, to the present. Don't think, I know I only have 20 minutes. Uh, I want to take you to the next piece of the story. And it's, it concerns something called EDRF. Those of you that are biologists know that when we don't know what something is, we name it, and it typically almost always has four letters. Uh, and I'll tell you what EDRF uh, is in a moment, uh, what it stands for. But it was, um, here's a blood vessel, blood flowing through the vessel. And I don't, if you've ever cut a garden hose in half, either intentionally or not, I did it once with a lawnmower. Well, my father wasn't so happy with the outcome of that. At least I could see what a, blood, what a, what a hose looks like on the inside. So let's say it's a green hose. It usually is composed of black rubber on the inside. Blood vessels is a hose. Pardon me to the physiologist here. And it has an inner piece, an inner wall, and then an outer wall. The inner part is something called the endothelium. They're just a lining of cells, like the black part of the, of the hose. And the outer part is smooth muscle. It's the muscle that has to relax if the blood vessel is going to dilate. So shown schematically here, what was known was that here's these endothelial cells, this part here, now shown here that they could be stimulated to make something that caused the smooth muscle to relax. So Bob Furchgott did this experiment where he scraped the endothelium off of a blood vessel. Sounds a little crude. It is. But then stimulated that same blood vessel and no relaxation took place. So he said there's something in the endothelium that's making something causing the smooth muscle to relax, so he named it, four letters, EDRF, endothelium-derived relaxing factor. Named for what it does, not for what it is, and the race was on to then figure out what it was. So the cardiovascular pharmacologist now for the next bunch of years will begin to fight, argue like we scientists do, trying to figure out what EDRF is. In another part of the world, in my case now in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I began my career at MIT, uh, our focus was not on NO, but it was on nitrite and nitrate, simple chemical formula shown here. Why care about nitrite and nitrate? Because it had been shown that nitrite and nitrate can react with secondary amines. And when they do that, they make nitrosamines, and these nitrosamines are carcinogenic. Now, you may remember this scare from everything that said you're not supposed to eat cured meats because they have nitrates in them. A lot of people say that my real interest in this problem in the beginning was driven by my Italian heritage and that I refused to believe that I couldn't have a good sausage once in a while. So here, in, it, it, why did we care and why did we get interested in nitrite and nitrate? Because a colleague of mine at MIT, Steve Tannerbaum had shown that mammals, animals like us, could make nitrite and nitrate. So should we be worried about the little bit we might be exposed to in either drinking water or through our diet if we're actually making it? It's kind of like the cholesterol problem in a way. You could limit your intake all you want, but you still need some and you have to make some, and it's those of us that make too much where it's a problem. So that's what we um, decided to explore. And there's a beautiful piece of serendipity in this too. So let me turn to those experiments that Tannenbaum did. 
So how do you determine that a mammal can make nitrate? Because our diet is so fluctuates so much in nitrate intake. What you have to do is take, uh, uh, you could do this with a rat, you could do it with a human, put them on a low nitrate diet and measure what they excrete. Turns out excretion is urinary, so it's easy to measure. And Tannenbaum had done this now uh, um, over a period of years to convince people that you were excreting more than you were taking in. Okay, now we know the end of the story. We know that, that this is actually coming from NO, which in solution isn't stable. It's toxic, it's also chemically reactive, and it falls apart to nitrate. So when, we were, when he was measuring nitrate here, he was actually measuring nitric oxide uh, decomposition. Here's where the serendipity comes in. This was an experiment done with an MIT undergraduate. They had a bunch of them that had committed to this low nitrate diet. It's not shown here. This particular student, a woman, uh, you can see her nitrate level went way up, skyrocketing up. It wasn't a blind study, so they called her up and said, what would you do? You cheated on the diet. You went out and ate a hamburger or something, right, because the diet wasn't so good. Turns out she said, no, she said, I actually had a really bad case of diarrhea, as it turns out had an intestinal infection, but I knew, this is maybe a good, this is a typical MIT story, good MIT undergraduate story, I knew how much you, you wanted the data, so I continued to collect my urine during the time that I was sick. So the simple conclusion could be whatever bug was colonizing her intestinal tract was making nitrate. The more interesting conclusion would be that it was coming from an immune system response to the infection. So shown here is an E. coli organism, and you can see these little feathers coming out of it here. These little feathers are something called lipopolysaccharide, and it's what your immune system recognizes when you get a bacterial infection. It says, you've got something there that doesn't belong there. I'm going to turn on a bunch of cells, immune system response, to kill that invading organism. So. Um, Tannenbaum and colleagues did the, did the key experiment. They took LPS, they treated rats with it, so they gave the immune response without the organism and the nitrate level went up, just like it did in that case of diarrhea. Now a postscript to this, because we use this information in the experiments that we did next, is that if you could come to the conclusion that I owe my whole career to a bad case of diarrhea and I, I wouldn't actually disagree with you. So with that result, we turn to the vast uh, literature of, of mice and mutants of mice. Um, and here's all the full complement of cells that are involved in an immune system. And because these mutations in these mice were well known, we could simply buy the mice and ask which of the cell types are responsible for making nitrate. It turns out it was macrophages. Macrophages made nitrate, and we used this cell to discover how the nitrate was made. And that's the simple chemical equation shown here. I'm not going to belabor that, of course, here, except to say that arginine is the source of nitrate. And you can go to a, a health food store today and buy arginine, and it's supposed to be a boost for your, your immune system or a, a boost for sexual function. Uh, I, I would say save your money on that one. But OK, so we know that a macrophage is activated, it makes nitrate. I, I, I should tell you also that a macrophage treated with LPS, like the, the, that generates the response to, to, to make nitrate, that macrophage is, is able to kill, and to kill invading organisms, tumor cells, bacteria. So the question became, you know, why does an activated macrophage make nitrate? Well, that's really unknown. But John Hibbs at Utah did a key experiment. He activated macrophages with LPS, so they were ready to kill. And he took away the arginine, and it couldn't kill anymore. So this is not very complicated scientific reasoning. I think you can see that 2 and 2 equals 4 here, that, that um, an activated macrophage was using arginine and using this nitrate pathway to kill invading organisms. OK, so the last part of the story comes back to EDRF. The pharmacologists trying to figure out what EDRF is set up experiments where they would look at a blood vessel and see what they could do to make it dilate. And what Salvador Moncada did and his colleagues in the UK was they added the stimulant that was known 
to get the, the endothelial cells to make EDRF, and it dilated, the, the, the blood vessel dilated, and then they did analytical chemistry on what was in the, the perfusate, and they found NO in it. So they came to the conclusion that this nitroglycerin and all these, these dilating, nitrovasal dilators work by making NO in your body and short-circuiting the, the pathway. Okay, so here's the sort of end of the story here. Nitric oxide is the central player. Um, there's the whole pathway. There's arginine again. This is unstable, ends up as nitrite and nitrate. When the EDRF folks said um, that um, NO was the key piece, they went to the literature and said, where could it possibly be coming from? And the only thing in the literature even close was our work on arginine to nitrates. We, on the other hand, saw, wow, EDRF is NO. NO is biological. It must be coming from decomposition of NO. So two very disparate fields of study, after very different kinds of questions, all came together on one single metabolic pathway making a molecule that is, by rights, um, a very difficult one to handle biologically. Now, the last part of the title said, said uh, yeah, so I should say the endothelial cells make a very small amount to dilate blood vessels, but macrophages actually make a lot to, in a localized area. In some ways, the, the analogy is how do you fight a forest fire? You dig a ditch around the fire to keep the, the fire from jumping over, and that's kind of what your immune cells do when they first show up, making a molecule like NO. They're kind of digging a ditch and trying to keep it localized in one place. So the last part of the story was Viagra. I promised that in the title. What does that have to do with anything that I'm talking about? Uh, here's a little cartoon. There's the enzyme that, that nitric oxide synthase that makes NO. There's the target enzyme. Uh, soluble guanylate cyclase. The key molecule is cyclic GMP, and that's the molecule that leads to vasodilation. So cyclic GMP is that end product. That's what causes vasodilation. It's got a limited lifetime because there's an enzyme that destroys it. And what Pfizer decided to do in 1986 was to make an inhibitor for the enzyme that degrades this. That way its levels would stay elevated. They weren't trying to treat uh, male impotence. They were trying to come up with a nitroglycerin that didn't have tolerance. And they thought if we could keep the level of this up, we might be able to vasodilate without tolerance, which is the key problem with nitrovasodilators. So they did a, quickly did a, a, a screen and they came up with a new molecule. This is, this is the structure of Viagra. And they started clinical trials, but the clinical trial turned up a significant side effect, and that was penile erections. And the side effect then became, as you know, the indication. But again, their driving force was to use the discoveries of NO as a signaling agent and try to get around the problem of tolerance, not realizing that, that the bigger problem, or that, the, that the, the greater effect of an NO inhibitor would be in the smooth muscle, penile smooth muscle, as opposed to heart muscle. Okay, so lastly, I, I do spend my time uh, trying to understand biology on a very chemical level, and so I'm always sensitive to people making jokes about chemistry, and now, I'm, now we're going to let uh, Calvin and Hobbes do that. So Calvin says, you know, I don't think chemistry is a science. I think it's a religion. And Hobbes says, a religion? Yeah, he says, all these equations are like miracles. You take two compounds, when you mix them, they magically become one, a new one. No one could say how it happens. Either you believe it or you don't. This whole book is filled of things that have to be accepted on faith. It's a religion. As a chemistry atheist, I should be excused from this. <laughs> and Hobbes says in the public schools, no less, call a lawyer. Thank you. Sure, we're going to get some questions about that. I'm not a physician. <laughs> uh, 
So how long did that whole process take to go from the beginning to the end? What were the days? Well, skipping over the nitroglycerin piece and getting to sort of modern day, the pharmacologists were batting around um, EDRF in the middle 70s to the late 70s. The, we began, my lab, with, with uh, building off of Tannenbaum's nitrate work in 1982 and 83. I would say by 19, actually 1990, NO was named Molecule of the Year by Science Magazine. So I guess, I guess if we, let Science Magazine dictate the world, that's, that's when it was settled. Ed Olszewski no. from Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, does any of this material work with uh, pulmonary hypertension in adults? In animals? Adults, adults. Oh, oh adults. Um, which some of whom are animals. <laughs> uh, actually, we're all which, animals. Which ones? We're all animals. Uh, some of us just behave more like them than others. Uh, it's, it hasn't been as successful. It's certainly been tried. Uh, and I think, and, and even in infants, it's about 40, 45 percent of the infants that end up going home uh, weaned off of NO. It, premature infants have a number of issues, including with oxygen exchange, not just the fact that they're not making enough nitric oxide. So, so for about half of them, it doesn't work at all. Then for the half that it does, uh, a good, good percentage of those then survive that in the past did not. Why it doesn't work in adults, uh, never, been, never really been clear. There's, from, from my biochemical mind, it should, but it hasn't worked. Erwin Shapiro, Cambridge. I enjoyed your talk immensely. I was wondering, when used as Viagra, what would the side effects be on the heart, on the blood vessels? Mm -hmm. Are there any adverse effects with some individuals? Uh, so there's a clear adverse, again, here I am practicing medicine without a license, so keep that in mind. But there's, there is a clear adverse effect, and, and it's noted every time it's on a TV commercial, and that is don't take nitrates and Viagra, because then it exacerbates it. Turns out it, it, maybe for the same reason that, you know, I can't explain why it doesn't work in adults, Pfizer started out with trying to treat angina without tolerance. And in principle, it should work in the heart. It just turns out that it has a minor effect in the heart. And the primary effect is, is in the corpus cavernosum, which is the smooth muscle in the, in the penis. But, um, you know, I, I, again, to stay out of the weeds today, I, I didn't mention that the enzyme that destroys cyclic GMP is a, something called a phosphodiesterase. It was abbreviated on the slide PDE, and if you were notice, it said PDE5. Well, it turns out there's about 12, I think, now PDEs, and they're all localized in different places. PDE5 is primarily in heart tissue, and at the time, they didn't even know anything about PDE5 in, the, in penile tissue. So they, had, they picked all the right problem. They, they, picked a, they inhibited the right phosphodiesterase. But in the end, you know, it didn't work. And it was really, it was, it was in the clinical trial of, not, of, of, uh, of healthy adults that they, were, they asked in passing. So, you know, what else, what else happened? You know, and, and it's not a thing that probably most men would just admit to, oh, yeah, you know, I, I, I seem to get an erection and it wouldn't go away. But finally, somebody mentioned it, and then a second person mentioned it, and of course, then they said, hmm. And then they, then they switched the trial entirely, because it wasn't working out on heart tissue. They switched the trial entirely to, to um, test for, for male impotence, and you know, the rest is history. And I, you know, I mentioned Viagra, I, but there's a whole you know, bunch of other companies, of course. There's, there's Cialis. There's all of them out there now. Betty Ruth Walter, Philadelphia. Uh, are all newborns given NO? And did we always did it? And or are there certain symptoms when a newborn requires it? And do you have to sign a legal paper, perhaps, given to your newborn? <laughs> uh, so uh, it, you know, it depends on uh, how uh, premature the infant is, to what the 
clinical problems are, of course. Uh, some subset have pulmonary hypertension. I don't actually know what that number is, but there's some subset that does. In the past, it was treated uh, a lot like adults are treated with epinephrine and other, other, horm other, other kinds of uh, hormonal treatments that, that were not, you know, they're, they're not effective and also not very safe to use in infants. So, so it really was a big, it did have a big influence on at least that subset that had pulmonary hypertension and their ability then to, to be able to go home in the end. I, I see a clear... Yes. <laughs> you should stay behind the pillar so the speaker doesn't see it. She really means it, Michael. 